Hi, in this video I am going to discuss uh, Edexcel IAL Unit 4, May June 2022 paper. All the questions will be discussed. Okay, first question, which of the following is a fundamental particle? You know fundamental particle means particle that has no internal structure or particle that cannot be broken into fragments. It's called fundamental particle. Uh, first answer given pion. Pion is a meson. It's made of a quark and antiquark, so it is not a fundamental particle. Proton, second answer, that is a baryon made of three quark, so it is also not a fundamental particle. Third answer given neutrino. Neutrino is a lepton. You know, uh, lepton is a fundamental part, it's a group called lepton. So the correct answer for question number one is C, which is neutrino. Question number two, a proton collides with an antiproton. Which of the following could be produced by this collision? So four different outcomes are given, the products are given. The first one, pi plus and neutron. So during collision, the product, can it be a positive pion and neutron? Okay, so you know during any particular nuclear interaction, certain factors must be conserved. What are they? Total mass energy must be conserved. Total momentum must be conserved. Total charge must be conserved. Additional to that, baryon number, lepton number and strangeness also must be conserved. So this should happen or these factors must be conserved during any particle or nuclear interactions example during radioactivity or radioactive decay also they must be conserved during fission fusion also they must be conserved or during any particle interaction such as uh, uh, for example i can say uh, uh, annihilation or pair production in those things also these factors must be conserved so here they are saying first product is positive pion and neutron. So answer A, they are saying a proton is interacting with antiproton and is it possible to give out a positive pion and neutron? Okay, so here if you check for charge, proton is plus one, antiproton minus one. So the total charge before interaction is zero. So here positive pion is plus one, neutron is zero. So you can say the charge is not conserved. Here the total charge is plus one, here total charge is zero. So charge is not conserved. So answer A is not acceptable. Answer B, they are saying negative pion. Answer B, they are saying negative pion and pi, uh, P plus. So here when you think about charge, charge will be conserved. When you check for charge, this is plus 1, this is minus 1, so that is 0. Here plus 1, uh, that is also plus, uh, this is pi minus, they gave, sorry, this is not pi plus, pi minus, so minus 1, and this is plus 1. So charge is conserved. So in the second one, charge is conserved. But if you check for baryon number, how baryon number is assigned? For any quark, baryon number is plus 1 by 3. For any antiquark, baryon number is minus 1 by 3. For any lepton, that is 0. So, meson consists of a quark and antiquark. So, its baryon number will be equal to 0. But for a baryon, it consists of three quarks. So, its baryon number will be plus 1. For antibaryon, such as antiproton, the baryon number is minus 1. So, when we check for baryon number, this is plus 1, this is minus 1. This is 0, this is plus 1, that is not conserved. So, answer B also not acceptable. When we check for answer C, the outcomes are given as uh, positive pion and electron. So, there if you check for charge, yes, it's conserved because this is plus 1, minus 1, 0, this is 0, charge is conserved. But when you think about lepton number, when you check for lepton number here, lepton number is assigned like this. For any quark, lepton number is 0. Therefore, meson, lepton number 0. Baryon also, lepton number 0. But for any leptons, lepton number is assigned as plus 1. Antileptons, minus 1. So when you check for lepton number, proton, lepton number 0. Antiproton also 0. Pion also 0 because it's made of quarks. This is plus 1. 
So left or number is not conserved. So answer C also not acceptable. So first three answers are not acceptable means the correct answer should be D. So the outcome is positive pi on and negative pi on. So the correct answer positive pi on and negative pi on. So normal students ask, we learned that when a proton interacts with its own antiproton. A particle interacts with its own antiparticle. Annihilation will occur. During annihilation, energy will be released in the form of photons. So how is it possible for to create positive pion and negative pion? So common question students ask. So what would have happened here when the proton interacts with antiproton, photon would have created, then that photon would have undergone, uh, that photon might uh, have a decay immediately and produce pi plus and pi minus. So decay of photon is called pair production. So what happened actually here? These two, this proton interacts with antiproton, annihilation will occur and photon will be produced. That photon will decay. Pair production will happen and produce positive pi on and negative pi on. Anyway, we don't need that detail. We can simply say the correct answer for question number two is D. Okay, question number three. So, capacitor stores energy W. The voltage across the capacitor is V. What could be the energy stored in it when the voltage across it is 2V? That's a question. So, we can use the equation W equal half C V squared. Now, when it has voltage 2V, I can say the energy stored in it is W1 is equal to half C 2V all things squared. So, square of 2V is 4. So, I can say 4 times half C V squared. That is 4 W. Correct answer, D. Okay, question number four. Two equally charged ions exert a force of 4 into 10 to the power minus 9 Newton on each other. The distance between the centers of the ions is 2.4 10 to the power minus 10 meter. Which of the following is equal to the charge on each ion? Okay, so there we can say the force according to Coulomb's law is given by F equal K Q1 Q2 over R squared. Here the question says equally charged means Q1 is equal to Q2. We can get let it be Q. So the force is given how much is it? 4 into 10 to the power minus 9. K given in the data sheet 8.99 uh, 8 10 to the power 9. Q into Q, Q squared over R squared, that is uh, 2.4 10 to the power minus 10, all things squared. Make the Q subject, you will get square root of cross multiply. So 4 into 10 to the power minus 9 into 2.4 10 to the power minus 10, all things squared, divided by 8.99 10 to the power 9 square root. So the correct answer is question number four, correct answer A. Okay, this diagram is given uh, for question number five. A wire is in the same plane as a magnetic field of magnetic flux density B as shown. The Y of length L and carries a current I. So the length of the Y is L. Which row of the table gives the magnitude and direction of the force on the wire? We know that we need the uh, component of the magnetic field perpendicular to the current. We need that. So here the perpendicular component of the magnetic field is B psi uh, B cos phi. The angle is measured with the normal to the wire. So the magnet, the perpendicular component will be B cos phi. So, F equal B cos phi into IL. So, that is B I L cos phi is the force acting on it. And if I draw the wire again separately, this is the wire. The component of the magnetic field which is perpendicular to the current is B cos phi, this direction. 
and the current is flowing along the wire this direction. So what will be the direction of the force? Use the Fleming's left hand rule, magnetic field along this direction, current is this direction, force will be into the page, force will be directed into the page. So the magnitude of the force is F equal BIL cos phi into the page. So correct answer A. Okay, question number six, electrons can be used to probe the nuclei of atoms. Which of the following best explains? So, when you are using a particle such as electrons uh, in, uh, when you study the structure of crystals in crystallography, we use the wave nature of the electron. That question came uh, May, June 2022, uh, unit two paper about crystal. Uh, crystallography, studying the uh, electron by you, uh, electron is used to study the structure of uh, atomic planes in crystals. Same way, when we use electrons to study the nuclear structure, they are also we use the wave nature of the electron. So, wave nature of the electron means we should think about the associated wavelength that is the de Broglie wavelength of the electron. So, de Broglie wavelength is given as lambda equal h over mv or h over p. Right. So, when we are using the wavelength, uh, uh, when we are using the wave nature of the particle means we heavily depends on the diffraction of the wave, the associated wave, the matter wave. When it pass around the nucleus, there will be uh, diffraction. To have significant diffraction, what should happen? The wavelength, the matter wave, its wavelength must be equal to size of the nucleus. So size of the nucleus is very small, almost 10 to the power minus 15 meter order. So to get such small uh, wavelength, the electron has to be accelerated to higher energy or we should accelerate the electron to higher energy to get higher momentum to get such a smaller wavelength. So in all these uh, studies when you are using the electron as a, uh, when you use electron to study the crystal structure in crystallography or when you use the electron to study the nuclear structure, we use the uh, property, the diffraction of the electron. So when we think about the diffraction of the electron, the matter wave, its wavelength must be almost equal to size of the uh, nucleus when we are studying the structure of the nucleus. So we should be able to accelerate and get the required energy, higher energy to get a, such a smaller wavelength. So correct answer for question number six is A, because electrons can be accelerated to very high energy. Why should be accelerated? To get the required energy to get the sufficient momentum to have smaller wavelength. So other answers are not suitable. Electrons can be deflected by magnetic field. Here nothing related to magnetic field. Electrons can be part of atom. Yes, that's true, but nothing related to this answer. Electrons can be released by thermionic emission. That's true. The electrons are, uh, we produce uh, electrons uh, by using thermionic emission, but that's not the specific reason in this specific uh, use. Here we use the uh, electron because it can be accelerated. So the correct answer for question number six is A. Okay, question number seven. Muons can travel at speeds close to speed of light. At these speeds, the lifetime and mass of a muon are different from those of stationary muon. Which row of the table describes the lifetime and mass of high speed muon? So you know that according to special theory of relativity, uh, when uh, a matter travels at very high speed, uh, its mass will increase. We learned that in cyclotron also, when the particles are accelerated, one of the drawbacks of the cyclotron, the mass will increase. Okay, so the mass will increase when the particle travels at very high speed, closer to speed of light. Also, there's another conclusion in the uh, special theory of relativity that's called time dilation. So when a clock travels in a uh, vehicle, and if the vehicle travels at very high speed, uh, almost the speed of light, the clock will run slowly. So there will be delay or there will be time dilation. So when that's time dilation means the lifetime of the 
neon will increase. So uh, if that's uh, actually we can do a separate lesson on that. But anyway, that's not in the Excel syllabus. Remember that when the when a clock travels at very high speed, or a clock which is kept in a vehicle, and if the vehicle travels at very high speed, which is closer to the speed of light, the clock will move slowly. So the clock will run slowly means there will be delay, means the lifetime of the muon will increase. So correct answer for question number seven is D. Question number eight. In a cyclotron, a charged particle is accelerated in a spiral path. Which of the following increases as the radius of the spiral path increases? So the radius is given by R equal mv over bq, R equal p over bq. So when the radius, now the question is which of the following increases as the radius of the spiral path increases? So if the particle moves in an outward spiral path, the mass has no change. Mass of the particle has no change. Magnetic field strength has no change. Charge of the particle has no change. When the R increases, velocity of the particle or the speed of the particle will increase. So question number eight, correct answer D. Question number nine, which of the following unit is equivalent to Farad? So you know that Q equal CV, C equal Q over V. The unit of capacitance is Farad that is equal to unit of Q is charge, uh, sorry, unit of charge is Coulomb, Coulomb per volt. So correct answer A. Okay, question number 10, it's about transformer. In the primary coil, current is varying as shown in this graph, right? Two coils are linked by an iron core as shown. Coil 1 carries an alternating current I. So there's a diagram of a transformer. The graph shows the variation of current I with time for two complete cycles. Which of the following graphs give the corresponding induced EMF across the coil to the secondary coil? So you know that uh, this is the current flow in the primary coil that follows a sine function, sine function, right? Uh, what will be the variation of induced EMF with time? So four different graphs are given. So induced EMF is given by d5 by dt minus d5 by dt. First, we should think about the magnetic field produced in the primary coil. So magnetic field produced by a current carrying inside the current carrying coil is given by, not in your syllabus, B equal mu naught n i. Anyway, not in your syllabus. Mu naught is called permeability. So mu naught has a value 4 pi into 10 to the power minus 7 newton per ampere minus 2. Not in your syllabus. But at least it's better you should know B directly proportional to I for a current carrying coil. The magnetic field produced inside the coil due to current flow is directly proportional to the magnitude of the current. So current is varying like this means it varies according to sine function means magnetic field is also going to vary according to the sine function. So the magnetic field lines will be transferred to the secondary coil through the iron core. So magnetic flux linkage with the secondary coil also will vary according to sine function. So the induced EMF in the secondary coil is given by phi equal minus del phi by del t this is called the minus sign is due to Lenz's law. That means actually minus d phi by dt rate of change of magnetic flux linkage is the induced EMF according to Faraday's law. So rate of change of means it's a differentiation, right? So you know that this magnetic flux linkage depends on sign function because the current is varying according to sign graph. So it will be a sine function, the magnetic flux linking with the secondary coil. You know that when you differentiate the sine, it will become cosine. So cosine means initially sine is starting with zero means cosine should start with maximum. But there is a negative sign. So the cosine, the induced EMF should be a cosine function with negative sign means it should start with negative maximum. So the induced EMF should be 
like this negative maximum something like this so correct answer if you check the four graphs correct answer is b okay question number 11 section b question number 11 a fly boat enables a person to hover at a constant height above the sea level what is constantly pumped up to the fly boat in a thick pipe a jet of water is then forced downwards causing an upward force on the fly boat calculate the velocity of the jet of water as it leaves the fly boat assume that water was uh, water has negligible velocity before it leaves the flyboard. Mass per, uh, per mass, sorry, mass of person and flyboard equipment given 175 kilogram. Mass flow rate means the rate of flow of mass of water is given 114 kilogram per second. So question number 11. So there, this is the flyboard. So flyboard push the water down at a very high speed. At a speed v, it's pushing down from rest. So the paper question says, uh, before the water is pushed down, it was at rest. So through the nozzles, the water is pushed down at higher speed force. So according to Newton's third law, the water will push the flyboard upward direction because water is pushed down by the flyboard through the nozzles. So according to Newton's third law, water will push the flyboard in upward direction with the same force. So when you think about the total mass of the flyboard and the person, the total weight is mg. The water is pushed down at a force f means, according to Newton's third law, the same force will be exerted on the flyboard by the water which is pushed out of the flyboard. Okay, so if the flyboard is hovering or floating, f must be equal to mg. So what is the force exerted on water when it is pushed down through the nozzle, we can use the rate of change of momentum of the water. Water is pushed down from rest at a particular velocity means the momentum of the water which is pushed down is changing. So there is a rate of change of momentum. So I can use F equal mv minus mu over t for the water pushed down. So mathematically I can write this is m over t p minus u. What is m over t? Rate of flow of mass. F is the force. Rate of flow of mass is given as 114, 114 kilogram. The velocity at which the water is pushed down, let it be v. And before it is pushed down, it was at rest. They asked to assume it was at rest. So the force will be equal to 114 v. Now, since the flyboard is hovering, I can say F equal mg. This F is equal to 114V. The mass of the uh, flyboard with the person is 175 kilogram into 9.81. Find the V. You will get 15.1 meter per Okay, so these diagrams are given on question 12, section B, question 12. Uh, in a game of snooker, a white ball and a black ball of equal mass are on the horizontal table. A player hits the white ball which then moves with a velocity of 1.2 meter per second. Uh, before colliding with the black ball, the player hopes that the collision will knock the black ball towards this pocket. He is expecting that. So after collision, the white ball is moving as shown in the second diagram. A part, this collision was inelastic. State what is meant by inelastic collision. So just one mark, you can say total kinetic energy is not conserved. That's the answer. Total kinetic energy is not conserved. Section B, uh, sorry, the part B, for this situation, a scaled vector diagram showing the velocities of the balls can be used to demonstrate law of conservation of momentum. Explain why. So, we know that 
we can draw a vector diagram for momentum and momentum is conserved but here the question says for this situation what is the situation this type of collision we are both have same mass right the white ball and the black ball both have the same mass in this situation a scaled vector diagram showing the velocities of the balls can be used to demonstrate the law of conservation of momentum so there's nothing called conservation of velocity but conservation momentum is there so if i think about the conservation momentum and if i write it in terms of vectors i can say the initial momentum in terms of vector simple e notation i'm using it initial momentum which is the momentum of the white ball before collision is equal to momentum of the black ball after collision in vectors i'm not just adding vectors momentum of the white ball after collision so you know momentum means mass times initial velocity i can call it as ui that's the velocity vectors is equal to mass time your vb in terms of vectors plus mass times vw in terms of vectors so it's a momentum conservation momentum i wrote it in terms of vectors simple right so here since they all have mass and mass is a scalar quantity they will get cancelled and it becomes ui vector is equal to vb vector plus vw vector that means since they have the mass now i can say the total velocity looks like total velocity is conserved and we can draw vector diagram for velocity here normally we draw vector diagram for the momentum but since the mass is the same and you know momentum is directly proportional to mass since the mass is the same and momentum is directly proportional to the mass we can draw a vector diagram for velocities and that will give the same shape as the vector diagram for the momentum Okay, part C. Deduce whether the black ball moves towards the pocket. You should use a scaled vector diagram. So, to check whether the black ball reaches the pocket, here this is the pocket. It should move at 50 degree from the horizontal. So we can draw a vector diagram. So we know the the velocity of the ball before collision. The white ball is uh, 1.2 meter per second. So we use a scale. uh like this 1 meter per second is equal to 10 cm so initially it's 1.2 meter per second that will be equal to 12 cm we can draw 12 cm that's the velocity of the white ball before collision and after collision velocity of the white ball is 0.92 meter per second that will be equal to 9.2 cm okay we should find these data will they give the direction of the black ball after collision towards the pocket so if it wants to reach the pocket it should make an angle 50 degree uh, from that point right with the horizontal line it should be 50 degree so we found the scale we know this is horizontal so first draw a horizontal line which is 10 cm sorry 12 cm draw a horizontal line by using the ruler draw a horizontal line that is uh, 12 cm then from here measure 35 degree because the white ball after collision is giving uh, has a velocity of 0.92 m per second so the total momentum after collision that means the resultant momentum now in some momentum we are going to draw velocity diagram so the result of these two vectors this one and this velocity should be equal to the initial velocity of the white ball so draw this velocity which is 9.2 cm measure this angle which is 35 degree and draw a line of 9.2 cm right so these two lines you know the length 
Now connect this point and this point that represents, that line will represent the velocity of the black ball after collision. So connect these two lines. Right, after connecting it, measure this angle, measure this angle theta. You will get 50 degree. You will get 50 degree. So that means if this is theta, you will get 50 degree when you draw correctly according to scale. So that means that shows the direction of, so I can put double arrow here because the resultant of the white ball after collision, resultant of the uh, white ball after collision and the black ball after collision should be equal to the velocity of the white ball before collision because we already explained instead of momentum vector diagram we can draw the velocity vector diagram so here this angle you will get 50 degree that means this is 50 means with horizontal the black ball is moving at 50 degree therefore it will reach the pocket that's the conclusion you should say after drawing it you measure this angle you will get 50 degree then you should say the black ball is moving at an angle of 50 degree with horizontal line therefore the black ball will reach the pocket that conclusion you must get okay question number 13 about linear accelerator so in that question the linear accelerator uh, it is about the gap between the uh, the distance between the adjacent drift tubes are increasing. Some particle physics experiments use electrons which are accelerated to very high energies by LINAC. The diagram shows the first section of the LINAC. Explain why the distance between the consecutive tubes increases in the first section of the LINAC but are almost equally spaced in the last section of the linear. So here you can say the particles gain kinetic energy or part the velocity of the particle increases or particle gain kinetic energy, charge particles, only when they cross the gap between the drift tubes. So the particles gain kinetic energy only when they cross the gap between the drift tubes. So when you think about the first gap and the second gap, so that means first gap means the gap between the first drift tube and the second drift tube. If you compare that gap with the gap between the second drift tube and the third drift tube, this, that gap will be larger. Why? The average velocity of the particle is increasing average velocity of the particle is increasing because particle is being accelerated but the particle is accelerated by using an AC signal with constant frequency that is constant period so particles should or must spend the same amount of time inside each gap but the speed of the particle the average speed of the particle is increasing therefore the gap between the drift tubes must be increased, right? But they are saying later in the explain why the distance between the consecutive tubes increases in the first section. I already explained that, but almost equal space in the last section. So when the speed of the particle becomes almost equal to speed of light, what happens? The particle speed is remaining constant because all the energy given to the particle we use to increase the mass of the particle not the speed of the particle because you know that one of the postulates in uh, special theory related nothing can travel beyond the speed of light so when the speed of the particle gets very closer to speed of light then after that the particle will move at constant velocity so the gap also will be kept the same amount because the average velocity will remain the same no further increase in velocity so that's the answer you should give for page uh, question number 30 
Okay, so question number 13, part B. In some experiments, high energy electrons collide with a stationary atom. In another experiments, beam of high energy electrons traveling in opposite directions collide head on. In opposite direction, yeah. New particles can be created from collisions. Deduce which type of collision is more likely to produce new particles with the largest mass. Okay, so we know that uh, in these collisions also, you are creating new particles, means there is particle interaction. So, all the six factors which I told already in question number uh, two, I think, question number two, yeah, conservation properties should be uh, here also conserved. So, one of the conservation property here is the momentum and the total mass energy must be conserved. Additional to that, baryon number, lepton number, strangeness, charge, they also must be conserved here also. But what happens if one particle is at rest and the other particle traveling at very high speed means uh, this particle is at rest and the particle is moving towards it at very high speed means after collision you won't be able to create particles, new particles with larger mass. The reason is before collision this is at rest, this is moving that means the initial total momentum is not equal to zero Initial total momentum not equal to zero means momentum must be conserved. So the final total momentum also must not be equal to zero. So that means after collision there could be many particles created but at least few particles or at least one particle must be in motion. So at least one particle must be in motion to conserve the momentum means because which is not equal to zero. So after collision a particle or few particles will carry kinetic energy. So initially we have certain amount of initial total mass energy. Out of that initial total mass energy, certain amount of energy will be used by the particles those are in motion after collision. So only the balance energy could be used to create new particles. So less energy is remaining to create new particles. But if both particles are moving in opposite direction at the same velocity, what happens? Initial total momentum will be equal to zero. Two identical particles moving in opposite direction at the, exactly the same magnitude of velocity, at same magnitude of uh, speed. That means initial total momentum will be equal to zero. Total momentum is conserved. So final total momentum also must be equal to zero. Final total momentum must be equal to zero does not mean always the particles created will be at rest. No. The particles can be in motion, but when you add their total momentum, it will be equal to zero. Right? So it's not the normal students have wrong idea. They think initial total momentum zero means after collision, all the created particles will be at rest. That will not happen always. All the particles created can move. But when you consider their total momentum, that will be equal to zero. But there is a chance, maybe one in million, or maybe one in, I don't know how much, one in million billion or one in thousand or whatever it is. But there is a chance all the particles created could be at rest. All the particles created could be at rest in that situation. That's an important situation for us. In that situation, when all the particles created are at rest, to conserve their total momentum equal to zero, then none of the particles are carrying kinetic energy. So all the initial total mass energy could be used to create new massive particles because none of them have velocity, so they don't have any kinetic energy. So all the initial energy could be used to create new massive particles. So that's the advantage of uh, when the particles move in opposite direction with the same magnitude of momentum. That's called colliding beam colliding colliders.
Okay, so question number 14. The diagram shows path of particles in a circular particle detector. There is a magnetic field acting at right angle to the plane. So it's acting perpendicular to the plane of the paper. The diagram is drawn to scale. One centimeter on the diagram represents 10 centimeter, right? In the particle detector. An antiproton enters the detector, so antiproton is coming here, enters the detector and collides with the stationary proton at x. So here is the stationary proton at x, right? Several particles are produced, so that's the reason they drew several lines like this branches. Several particles are produced. One particle is the K0, that is neutral kion. The kion then decays into two pi ions, pi plus and pi minus, or pi plus and pi minus, is actually produced by chi ion, right? Determine the momentum of the negative pi ion. So negative pi ion, its momentum, we need to find it. Magnetic flux density of the field is given, 7 tesla. Okay, so you know that R equal P over BQ. So, we need to find the momentum P. So magnetic field is given. Negative pi on charge is negative 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. We don't normally use minus sign there. So only thing I need to find the radius. How can I find the radius of this curve given on the diagram? So it's given something like this way. The curve is something like this. Okay, how can I find the radius of it? Okay, simple geometry. If you have a radius something like this, at two points, draw tangent to the curve. At two points, draw tangent. Then draw lines from those tangents perpendicular to the tangent. So if you draw a line perpendicular to the tangent, here also if you draw a line perpendicular to the tangent, they will meet at the center. So R1, R2, measure those lengths and find the average. That will be the average radius of the curve. Okay. Then multiply it by 10 because the question says it's actually 1 centimeter on the diagram represents 10 centimeters. So after you draw a tangent here, at this point draw a tangent. At this point draw a tangent to the curve by using a ruler. Then from the tangent draw a perpendicular line. Draw a perpendicular line here also. They meet at one point. So measure each length. So when I measured, I got both R1 and R2. I got it as 1.6 centimeter. You might get slightly different. It's okay. So that means actual radius. Radius. I should multiply by 10. That is 16 centimeter. Because... I should multiply by 10 because scale is given like that. So I know the radius. Now substitute in this equation R equal P over BQ. That is 16 into 10 to the power minus 2 meters. I need to find the momentum P. So I need to find the average. But here since I got same, I am using the same value. But if you are getting slightly different, find the average of R1 and R2. Right. So P over BQ. Magnetic field strength is given as 7. Charge is negative pi on minus 1, so that is 1.6, 10 to the power minus 19. So find the P, you will get P is equal to 1.79, 10 to the power minus 19 kilogram meter per second. That's the answer for question number 40A part. Okay, question number 14, B part, state two ways that the diagram shows kion is neutral. You know that neutral particles never produce track, so you can see the decays occurring, the, the initial uh, interaction that is, uh, they are saying an antiproton enters the detector, collides with the stationary proton at X, so that's happening at X. So from X, the kion would have moved, the neutral kion would have moved from here to here, but not producing any track. So first evidence, kion is a neutral particle. Why? It did not produce any track until it reaches this point. Then at this point, it's decaying. 
you know, during decay, total charge must be conserved. So these are the two particles produced that decay. So total charge is plus minus. If you add them, it will be zero. That also shows the chiron is a neutral particle because total charge is conserved. Okay, part C, the table shows the charge for up, down, up quark and the down quark as a fraction of the charge on the proton. Deduce the quark structure of the antiproton and antipion. So, antiproton, so the charge is given. Antiproton, you know, minus 1 means U bar, U bar, D bar. So, the uh, part C, antiproton, U bar, U bar, D bar. Then negative pi on pi on that is negative. I need to get negative minus one by using the given charges. Means if you know pi on is a meson, means it consists of quark and antiquark. What are they to give minus one charge? Should be D and anti U. Charge of D is minus one. Charge of anti U will be minus two by three. When you add minus 1 and minus 2 by 3, you will get minus 1. That will be the charge of negative pi on. So, negative pi on, its uh, combination will be u bar d. Okay, question number 14. Part D, calculate the mass of a proton in giga electron volt over C. So it's just a method. You should remember the method. So part D, you know mass of a proton is equal to uh, 1.67 10 to the power minus 27 kilogram given uh, in the data sheet. Okay, to convert to that particular unit, giga electron volt over C squared, we should find the equivalent energy of this mass in giga electron volt by using E equal mc squared. So when you are using E equal mc squared, so we should find it by using E equal mc squared. So, So that is 1.67 10 to the power minus 27 into 3 into 10 to the power 8 all things squared. We will get it in joules but we need to get it in giga electron volt. So to convert joule to, joules to electron volt we have to divide it by 1.6 10 to the power minus 19. So we will get it in electron volt to get it giga electron volt divide again by 9. So giga electron volt. So that will be equal to 0 0.939 giga electron volt. So energy which is equal to mass of a proton is equal to 0 0.939 giga electron volt. Now we need to find the mass. So M equal E over C squared. We know that E equal MC squared. We are, if I make the M subject, M equal E over C squared. Instead of this E, substitute 0 0.939 giga electron volt over C squared. So that is 0 0.939 giga electron volt over C squared. So answer is 0 0.939 is the mass of proton in this unit. Okay, so question number 15, this diagram is given there. A resistor capacitor circuit provides an input for an integrated circuit as shown. The integrated circuit can be assumed to have infinite resistance. Okay, so normally students get confused when they see this diagram because they think it's an incomplete circuit. No, it's not an incomplete circuit. So the potential difference between the capacitor with the resistance given at 5 volt, this is 0 volt means the difference is 
uh, fiber. We can assume that. Then students normally ask, this is the electronic circuit. They are saying, the question says, this is electronic integrated circuit. Uh, integrated circuit, this one. So, how can there be just one wire connected to integrated circuit? No, actually, the other wire, that is the negative side, is not shown. We can draw and complete the circuit something like this way. Uh, if you want, you can imagine like this way, a battery, DC power supply, connected, the negative terminal connected to the zero. This is 5 volt. You can imagine like this. This is 5 volt connected to this terminal. This terminal is connected to negative terminal that is taken as zero volts. So for example, we can take that point is connected to earth or we can assume that is just reference point. Say for in a this normal dry cell, 1.5 volt, that means the potential difference is 1.5. If I take this is zero, the negative terminal is zero volt, then the positive terminal will be plus 1.5. If I take positive terminal is 0 volt, then the negative will be minus 1.5. The only thing I can say, the difference should be 1.5. If I take this is 0 volt, then this will be 1.5. So the difference is 1.5 minus 0 is 1.5. If I take the positive terminal 0 volt, then the negative terminal will be lower than 0, that will be minus 1.5 volt, 0 minus minus 1.5 will be equal to 1.5 volt that's the voltage across the cell right so normally we take the negative terminal as zero volt or we can imagine that terminal is connected to the earth line so here also we can assume this terminal is connected to the negative sign or to the earth line this is the positive line same way the input voltage to the ic is starting from the voltage this point means the voltage applied to the I see integrated circuit as an input voltage is between this point and this point. The voltage across this point, I can name it as X, and the zero, this terminal, is the voltage applied to the integrated circuit. Then the output voltage also will be between this point and the zero volt. So we can take the zero volt like this, we can connect it like this. No problem. So the output voltage, this is 0 volt. So the output voltage is the voltage across the 0 and this terminal. The input voltage is between 0 and this terminal. So actually mostly this type of circuits we use in electronics. But in your question also, uh, this type of diagram is given in this paper. Nothing to get confused. Don't worry about just one wire given. So just one wire means the voltage given to the integrated circuit is the voltage across X and this point. Output voltage is between this terminal and the zero voltage terminal which is not shown on the diagram. So I'll remove the diagram again. I'll leave it as what they gave. Okay, so the question here, the first part, question number 15, A part, sketch a graph to show how the potential difference we see across the capacitor varies with time t as the switch is closed. The time constant t for this circuit is marked on the time axis. So they have given the axis with capital T, that's a time constant. We need to draw the circuit. Okay, so we should know that Initially, at the moment when the circuit is switched on, so again I'll draw if I complete the DC power supply like this. When the circuit is switched on at that moment, uh, this is 5 volt. So initially the voltage across the resistor will be 5 volt, voltage across the capacitor will be 0. You know according to Kirchhoff's second law, Vr plus Vc in this closed circuit when the switch is on, Vr plus Vc will be equal to 5 volt. Initially, there is no charge, so according to Q equal CV, since the Q is 0 initially for the capacitor, VC will be 0. So, VC equal 0, voltage across the resistor will be the 5 volt initially. And we know that during the charging process, the current will decrease exponentially according to I equal I naught e to the power minus T over C. 
and I naught is given as the EMF, which is 5 volt EMF over resistance of the circuit. That's the initial current. So the current will decrease exponentially. So when the current decreases exponentially according to V equal IR, the voltage across the resistor also will decrease exponentially. So when the voltage across the resistor decreases exponentially, and VR plus VC equal to 5 volt, the EMF, 5 is the EMF. Since the voltage across the resistor decreases exponentially, voltage across the capacitor should increase, right? So there are the increase exponentially, I can say. So the graph should be like this. This is the graph. The shape of the graph should be like this. Finally, it will become 5 volt. The voltage across the capacitor will become 5 volt. So they marked a time constant there. So at time constant, what will happen? The voltage across the resistor, the current through the resistor will decrease to 37 percentage of the initial current, is it? So current through the circuit, charging circuit will decrease exponentially. I already explained that. So the voltage across the resistor will decrease exponentially. So the voltage across the capacitor, how much will it be at one first time constant? That means the voltage across the resistor will become 37 percentage of the initial voltage. That is 5 into 0 0.37. So 5 into 0 0.37 uh, will be equal to will be equal to 1.85 volt. So voltage across the capacitor will be equal to 5 minus Vr, that is 1.85. So that's going to be 3.15. So at first time constant, the voltage across the capacitor will be 3.15. So here you must mark, so at this T is given on your graph. So you must mark the relevant value 3.15. I can put 3.15 volt. That's the answer for eighth part, first part. Right, A part, second part. Explain how the potential difference Vr across the resistor varies with time after switch is closed. So there you can say initially the voltage across the resistor is equal to 5 volt and the voltage across the capacitor equal to 0. Then you should say the current in the circuit will decrease exponentially. Therefore, the voltage across the resistor also will decrease exponentially. So I am not writing it. Again, I will tell the answer. Initially, the voltage across the capacitor is equal to 0 and the voltage across the resistor is equal to 5 volt. The current in the charging circuit will decrease exponentially and some of the SUM, some of the voltage across the capacitor and the resistor is equal to 5 volt. Therefore, the voltage across the resistor will decrease exponentially during the time. Okay, that's the answer for question number A part, second part. Now question number A part, third part, show that Vc is given by the equation. They are giving an expression. Okay, so it's not an issue. Okay, so question number 15, third part. Uh, that is question number 15, uh, A part, third part. We know that Vr plus Vc equal to 5. Voltage across the resistor will decrease exponentially. You know that. So I can say Vr initially 5 volt. So I can say uh, Vr will decrease exponentially. Exponentially according to Vr equal V naught, that is 5, initial voltage of the uh, resistor will be equal to 5, Vr equal, 
exponentially according to vr equal v naught e to the power minus t over rc and v naught equal 5 volt therefore we can say uh, vr is equal to 5 e to the power minus t over rc so Vc is equal to 5 minus Vr. Vr is equal to 5 e to the power minus T over Rc. So voltage across the resistor decreases according to Vr equal V naught e to the power minus T over Rc. V naught is the initial voltage. At the moment you switch on, at the moment you switch on, the voltage across the resistor will be equal to 5 volt. That is the EMF because no voltage across the capacitor since it has no charge. Then the voltage across the resistor will decrease exponentially because the current flow will decrease exponentially. Vr equal Ir. So I will decrease exponentially. So Vr also will decrease exponentially according to this equation. But any instant Vr plus Vc equal 5. So Vc is equal to 5 minus Vr. And so Vr I can put V naught e to the power minus T over C. But V naught equal 5 volt. So Vc equal 5 minus 5 e to the power minus T over C. Okay, B part. The input to the integrated circuit should be 3.3 volt at a time of 3.5 seconds after the switch is closed. The following capacitors are available. So you can see that the diagram again, if you see that, uh, voltage across the integrated circuit. So this is 5 volt here, the switch. This is the IC. So voltage across the cap, uh, integrated circuit uh, it's given the voltage across the integrated circuit at 3.5 seconds should be 3.3 volt means the voltage here should be 3.3 volt. So here this is 0 volt, here 0 volt. So here 0 volt at this point because voltage this is the input to the circuit I already explained that this is 0 volt means the integrated circuit the input voltage is voltage across these two points. That's the voltage across the capacitor. Can you see that? This is the voltage across the capacitor. So voltage across the capacitor must be equal to 3.3 volt at a time of 3.5 seconds. And we already derived the equation for voltage across the capacitors as 5 minus 5 e to the power minus T over RC. We already derived it. Now Vc must be equal to 3.3 at a time of 3.5 seconds. So 3.3 that is the input to the high integrated circuit. That's the voltage across the capacitor because this is 0. This is 3.3 means that's the voltage across the capacitor. 3.3 equal 5 minus 5 into e to the power minus the time is given as 3.5 over the resistance is given as 68 kilo ohms. I will find the RC that's easy to solve. So from this find the RC, so you know how to solve it. Uh, you will get uh, 5 into e to the power minus 3.5 over RC equal 5 minus 3.3 uh, equal to uh, 1.7. Is it? Solve it. You know, take both sides LN and solve it. Divide by 5 and take it. You will get RC is equal to 3.24. 3.243 seconds. You know the unit of RC time constant is seconds. So we need to find the C. C is equal to 3.243 over R. R is given as 68 kilo ohms means 68,000. So 68 kilo ohms means 68 into 3. So solved it. You will get this one 4.77. 10 to the power minus 5 farad in microfarad. I need 10 to the power minus 6 need 47.7 or 47.7 microfarad 10 to the power minus 6. So the required uh, capacitor should be 47 microfarad. That's the closest value 
on the given uh, different capacitors, 47 microfarad. That's a required capacitor. Okay, question number 16. In the early 20th century, experiments were carried out in which alpha particles were directed towards thin gold foil. Simplified diagram of the apparatus used is shown. State now A part. State the observations and the corresponding conclusions. Okay, that you can find in all textbooks. The first observation, most of the alpha particles went straight to the gold foil or most of the alpha particles went with very little deviation through the gold foil and the relevant conclusion most of the atom is empty space. Second observation, few of the alpha particles had smaller angle of deflection less than 90 degree that shows or uh, that shows there is a concentration of charge inside the atom. Third observation, very few, that is 1 in 8000 alpha particles almost bounced back or deviated with angle greater than 90 degree. Relevant conclusion is most of the mass of the atom is concentrated at one point in a smaller region, in a smaller region. That word must be there, concentrated at one point in a smaller region. These are the three observations and the relevant conclusions. Okay, question number 16b. One experiment used a gold foil made from the gold isotope AU19779. So the mass number of AU, the gold is 197. Its atomic number, that means the number of protons it consists of, is 79. So the charge will be charge of the nucleus of gold will be 79 into 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. The alpha particles had an initial kinetic energy of 4.7 mega electron volt. Show that the closest distance these alpha particles can get to the gold nucleus is about 5 into 10 to the power minus 14. So that means here this is the alpha particle. It had a kinetic energy of uh, 4.7 mega electron volt. It's directed towards the gold nucleus. So when they get closer, you know alpha particle is a positively charged particle. Gold nucleus consists of 79 protons. So like charges, the protons will repel the alpha particles. So alpha particle will lose its kinetic energy. You can tell in terms of energy or you can tell in terms of forces. If I say in terms of energy, when the alpha particle moves towards the gold nucleus, the alpha particle will experience opposing force. So they lose their kinetic energy and that kinetic energy will be used to do work against the electric potential created by the gold nucleus. So the work done against electric potential is given by W equal QV. So if I say the closest distance the alpha particle reached is this point. This is the point where it reached. That point, if I name it x and the distance, the closest distance d. So at point x, the kinetic energy of the alpha particle will be equal to zero, right? So there I can say loss in kinetic energy of alpha particle equal gain in electrical potential energy I can see or work done against electric electrostatic force. So when you throw a ball vertically upwards, initially it has a kinetic energy when you throw a ball vertically upwards. So the ball will 
have initially kinetic energy when the ball moves in gravitational field the ball will do work against the gravitational pull or I can say the ball will do work against the gravitational pull or I can say the ball will gain gravitational potential energy so same way here I can say the alpha particle will do work against the electric field or electrostatic force or I can say the alpha particle will gain electrical potential energy electrical potential energy so loss in kinetic energy initially it has kinetic energy kinetic energy initially minus kinetic energy finally final kinetic energy is zero so initial kinetic energy is 4.7 mega electron volt converted joule that is 4.7 10 to the power 6 into 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 or i can write this way first before substitution i can say initial kinetic energy minus final kinetic energy at x which is going to be zero gain in electrical potential energy that is the work done in my case electric potential what is v v is the potential of gold nucleus at x v is the electrical potential of AU, the gold nucleus at the point X. Okay, so kinetic energy initially is 4.7 mega 10 to the power 6 to convert to joule minus final kinetic energy is 0. Charge of the alpha particle uh, is uh, 2. HE2 plus helium nucleus is the alpha particle so 2 into 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 into V the potential difference you know that V equal KQ over R we know that V equal KQ over D right K is uh, 8.99 10 to the power 9 charge of the gold nucleus is uh, 79 protons into 1.6 10 to the power minus 19 over kq over d d okay so v is the electrical potential of the au so solve it lot of numbers are there carefully solve it you will get d is equal to 4.84 10 to the power minus 14 meter so that is almost 5 into 10 to the power minus 14 meter so what is V? Is the electrical potential of AU nucleus at point X. So that you know that I can say V equal K Q over D. Q is the charge of the gold nucleus. So that was B part first part of question number 16. Now B part second part of question number 16. Calculate the strength of the electric field due to gold nucleus at this distance. So I need to find the electric, the electric field strength at x. So E equal K Q over D squared 8.99 10 to the power 9. Q is 79 into 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 over d squared so the d squared is 4.84 10 to the power we found it already 10 to the power minus 14 all things squared so solve it you'll get 4.85 10 to the power 19 newton per coulomb Okay, question number 17 uh, related to circular motion 
Hammer throwing is an Olympic sport. A hammer is a metal sphere attached to a chain. An athlete holds the chain and spins around uh, so that he uh, the sphere moves in a circle. The chain is in, uh, is inclined at 40 degrees to the horizontal as shown. A part, first part, tension in the chain acting on the sphere is capital T. Draw free body force diagram for the sphere at the position of shown in the diagram. So the diagram shown is like the person is, I can't draw the actual diagram. So it's like this. Uh, so here is the string. So at this position, this making an angle of 40 degree to the horizontal. So at that position, uh, the free body force diagram if I draw, there will be two forces. One is the weight towards the ground. So that is mg or weight. The other one is the tension. That makes angle 40 to the horizontal. Right. Second part, A part, second part. Explain why the sphere moves with circular motion. So actually, in this uh, throw, the, it's not moving in a horizontal circle. You know the way the hammer is rotated. The hammer will be rotated in a circular path like this way. At an angle. So that's the way it will be rotated at an angle like this path. Okay, so center will be somewhere here. So why it is moving at a circular path means we can say the answer there will be a resultant force the components of the weight and the tension provide a resultant force that is perpendicular to the direction of the velocity direction of velocity will be always along the tangent to the uh, path path is drawn by dotted line so velocity will be perpendicular to the path so the resultant force of tension and the component of the weight will be the centripetal force which is perpendicular to the direction of velocity. Okay, part third part, the sphere completes 2.8 revolutions per second. So number of revolutions means frequency uh, given 2.8 hertz or 2.8 revolutions per second. Let's see, that's a number of rotations per second is the frequency. Calculate the acceleration of the sphere. Distance from the sphere to the center of the circle is given. So we know the distance means from the center of the circle to the sphere means that's a radius given, the frequency given. We need to find the acceleration. So we know that A equal r omega squared omega equal 2 pi f so radius is given 1.5 omega equal 2 pi f so 2 pi into frequency is given 2.8 all things squared so solve it 464.2 meter per second squared Okay, be part of the same question, 17. The athlete finally releases the sphere with a velocity of 28 meter per second at an angle of 40 degree to the horizontal. So it's going to move on a projectile motion, what you learned in unit one. She releases the sphere at a height of 1.5 meters above the ground. The women's Olympic record distance for the hammer throw is 83 meters. Deduce whether this throw would break the record. So I need to find the range. So it's a projectile motion, nothing related to circular motion, it's unit one. I need to find the range. From the range, I should check that value with 83 meters and give the final conclusion. Okay, so I use S equal ut plus half 80 squared vertically downwards for the whole motion. Complete motion. 
So this is 1.5. So I use downwards S equal UP plus RAT squared for the whole motion. That is 1.5 downwards from here to here, the vertical displacement, 1.5 meters. Initially, the velocity vertical direction, if I resolve it, 28 sine 40 upwards, I am using downwards, so minus 28 sine 40 into t plus you know the gravitational acceleration is downwards 9.81 meter per second squared so plus that is downwards I am using downwards so that is half into 9.81 t squared so rearrange it half into 9.81 is 4.905 t squared solve this one minus 18t minus 18t uh, minus bring it to the right minus 1.5 equal to 0 so 28 sine 40 is 18t check that again uh, 28 sine 40 yeah 17.998 so I put it as 18 so 18t minus 1. So it's a quadratic equation. Solve it by using your calculator in uh, equations mode. So you will get t will be equal to two answers. One is 3.75 seconds or t equal to minus 0 0.082 seconds. We know that time cannot be a negative quantity, so this is not accepted, so it's a uh, not a suitable answer. So this is the actual time. So therefore the time will be equal to 3.75 seconds. So use horizontally, s equal ut plus half a t square to find the range. So r equal, uh, horizontal component will be 28 cos 40 into 3.75 plus half horizontally there is no acceleration we neglect the drag force no deceleration also so that is zero i don't need to multiply anything because you are going to get this part zero so solve it you will get uh, 80 point four meters that is less than 83 meter so it is not a world record so this throw will not uh, break the world record Okay, question 18, uh, that's the last question of this paper. A student investigated electromagnetic induction, sorry, electromagnetic braking using the apparatus shown. A vehicle consisting of a glider and aluminum plate was placed on an air track. A powerful magnet was positioned between the two light gates so that the aluminum plate could pass between the poles of the magnet their resistance on the vehicle is negligible. So they are giving a diagram also. And the, you know aluminum plate is kept on the glider. It's going to pass through the north and south pole of the uh, magnet. So that means magnetic field is directed perpendicular to the sheet or perpendicular to the plane of the paper. Careful. So we don't know which one is the north pole, which one is the south pole. But the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the paper. It could be into the paper or out of the paper. We don't know which one is the north pole. But anyway, one thing we can say the magnetic field is perpendicular to the paper means magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the aluminium sheet. Okay, so a part, first part, the vehicle was given a push, the aluminium plate took 
0 0.19 second to pass through the light gate 1 show that the momentum of the vehicle was 0 0.3 newton second so length of the plate 15 centimeter mass of the vehicle so that's nothing actually you need one idea i need to find the velocity when we are using light gate velocity is equal to length of the interruption card here the aluminium plate is the interruption card divided by the interruption time or the time recorded by the uh, timer so that is given as 0 0.19 seconds so question 18 a part first part so velocity equal length of the interruption card over time that is 15 centimeter means convert to meter divided by the time is 0 0.19 so that will be 0 0.789 meter per second or 79 meter per second so initial momentum equal to mv i can say pi initial momentum pi equal to mv so that is mass is given 0 0.40 into 0 0.789 so that will be 0 0.32 newton second approximately 0 0.3 newton second that's the first part answer Second part, the vehicle then moved between the poles of the magnet before passing through the light gate 2. You can see the diagram. There is a second light gate. Before the second light gate, there is a magnet. So, when the uh, metal plate passes through the magnetic field produced by the magnet, it is slowing down. So, 10% of the uh, kinetic energy is reduced. Uh, reduced by 10%. Calculate the velocity of the vehicle at light gate 2. So, 10% of the kinetic energy is lost. So, we need to find the initial kinetic energy. We know the uh, initial momentum. So, we can find the initial kinetic energy by using kinetic energy equal p squared over 2m or we found the velocity. We can find the initial kinetic energy by using half mv squared. Either way, we can do. Right? So, a part, second part. So, initial kinetic energy equal half. The mass is 0 0.40 into the velocity 0 0.789 squared. So, that will be 0 0.125 joules. So, the final kinetic energy is 90% of it because 10% is lost. So, 0 0.125 into 0 0.9. So, that will be equal to 0 0.113 joules. So, 0 0.113 is equal to half mv squared into v2 squared. So, find the final speed or 0 0.v squared, whatever it is. So, v will be equal to 0 0.752 meter per second. That's the velocity just before it reaches the second light gate. Right. Now, B part, first part. Explain why the current was produced in the aluminium plate as it passes between the poles of the magnet. Why there is an induced current actually. You know, this is IGCSE question. So, you can say with the aluminium plate moves through the magnet or moves through the poles of the magnet the aluminium plate will cut the field lines you can say or you can say there is a change in magnetic flux linkage with the aluminium plate either way you can say again i'll tell when the aluminium plate moves through the or moves between the poles of the magnet the aluminium plate will cut the field lines, you can say, or there is a change in magnetic flux linkage with the aluminium plate. Therefore, I call Faraday's law, EMF will be induced. One mark. Since the metal plate provides a complete circuit, your metal is a conductor, and that plate provides a complete circuit, there will be current flow. That will be the second mark for this question.
Okay, so the B part, second part, the kinetic energy of the vehicle decreased as the aluminium plate moved between the poles of the magnet. Explain why. So already we said there will be induced current flow. So this current will generate or create a magnetic field around it and this magnetic field will interact with the magnetic field of the magnets. Therefore, the aluminium will experience a magnetic force and according to Lenz's law, this magnetic force will be such that to oppose the motion of the uh, glider. So therefore, it will slow down. So part C of this question, uh, the investigation was repeated using different aluminium plates with the same length but different thickness. The vehicle was given the same approximate initial velocity each time. The table shows the thickness of each aluminium plate and the corresponding percentage reduction in the kinetic energy of the vehicle. So you can see when the thickness of the aluminium plate increases, percentage reduction in the kinetic energy is increasing. So it's losing more kinetic energy when the thickness increases. It's interesting, yeah. So that the percentage reduction in kinetic energy is proportional to the thickness of the plate. So that means we need to show the thickness of the plate, so thickness of the plate is directly proportional to percentage reduction in kinetic energy. We need to show that. We have to show this. That means thickness is proportional to percentage reduction. Means if I put it equal side, there should be a constant times, constant into percentage reduction. That means thickness over Reduction. So that means, get the idea, thickness divided by percentage reduction should be the same constant. We will see whether we are getting the same constant when we divide the thickness by the percentage reduction or the other way. Percentage reduction is divided by the thickness. Either way, either way, percentage reduction divided by the thickness, are we getting the same constant? So we will see like this. For the first one, first plate, for the first plate, we can say the percentage reduction divided by the thickness, 0 0.50, you will get 20. For the second plate, the percentage reduction is 16 divided by the thickness is 0 0.80, that also 20. Third plate, Percentage reduction 22 divided by 1.1 thickness that also 20. So everywhere the ratio is the same means from hence I can say hence I can say uh, percentage reduction is directly proportional to thickness of the plate. Part C, second part of question number 18, suggest why the percentage reduction in kinetic energy increases. You can see the table given in uh, part C, increases as the thickness of the plate increases. Okay, so we know that 
the kinetic energy is lost due to the opposing force or kinetic energy is lost due to the work done against the opposing force. So that means when the thickness increases, it's doing more work against the opposing force. How is it possible? The reason is, uh, that means if it wants to do more work against the opposing force, means the force should increase, is it? So now we'll think about the uh, unit 2, R equal rho and lower A. Now if I'm given something like a metal plate, something like this, a metal plate, so I draw a, draw a thicker one, right? So the resistance of this metal plate, if I say that has no meaning, so resistance of the plate depends on the direction of the current flow. If I send current this way, if the current flows into this plate, into this phase, and comes out through this phase, right? If the current is flowing into this front phase and coming out through the back phase, then the resistance is given by R equal rho L lower A. The length is, this is the length. In this one, this is the length. And area is area of cross section which is perpendicular to the current flow. This will be the area in this situation. So that will be the resistance for the current flow. Electrical resistance, when we are using the current flow as I showed in this diagram, rho is constant that does not depend on the uh, dimension of the material. But length means this is the length, area means this area which is perpendicular to the current flow. But if I use the current like this if the current is uh, flow if the current flows like this way if the current flows this way if the current goes this way and comes out to this one then the length will be r equal rho l over a if i use for the electrical resistance to calculate then the length will be this one this is the length this is the length and the area will be this one this is the area Okay, so like that, the electrical resistance of a material is not fixed. It depends on the direction of the current flow, through which end the current is entering and from which end the current is coming out. That decides the electrical resistance of the uh, material. So in this question, you know that the metal plate, the aluminium plate is passing through the magnetic field and we already explained there will be induced current flow. We will see what will be the direction of the, what will be the direction of the current flow. If I think about the metal plate like this, if I think about the metal plate like this, Right, so this is going to be the thickness. This is going to be the thickness of the metal plate. So they are changing the thickness. That is going to be the thickness of the metal plate. And we know, I already explained, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the current flow. So the magnetic field is, sorry, magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the paper I told. But I told, we don't know whether the direction of the magnetic field into the page or out of the page, we don't know because we don't know which one is the north pole, right? But we know that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the page or perpendicular to the white board. I'll say the magnetic field is into the board. You see, I do it like that. Okay, so the, according to the given diagram, the trolley is moving from right to the left. So the, the glider is moving from right to left. So the force must act on the aluminium sheet towards right to oppose the motion. This force is due to the induced current. So I know the direction of the force on the aluminium plate due to the induced current. I know it's towards right because that will oppose the motion towards left. I know the direction of the magnetic field. So what could be the direction of the induced current? I can use the Fleming's left hand rule. I know the force towards right, magnetic field into the board. I took it into the board or out of the board, no problem. Into the board I took it. The force is to the right, so the current should be downwards. So the current will flow downwards. This is the direction of the current. So current will flow this direction. If I take the magnetic field is out of the page, no problem. 
So there, if I take the magnetic field is out of the page and the force is this way, current will flow upward direction anyway. That also has no problem. But here I know current is flowing from upper phase to the bottom phase. For this current flow, you know, I consider R equal rho L over A. The electrical resistance for this current is provided by this height. Height of the plate is the L height of the plane because current is flowing from this point to this point. So this height of the or width of the metal plate is the length. Which one is the area of cross section? Area of cross section is this area, the upper area. That area depends on the thickness. This area is equal to thickness into the width of the plate. So in this practical, they are keeping the same length, same width, only thing, they are changing the thickness of the plate. They are changing the thickness of the plate. That means when the thickness of the plate increases, the area of cross-section which is perpendicular to the current flow will increase. So area of cross-section increases means resistance will decrease. Other quantities, the length means the height of the aluminium sheet is not changing. That remains the same. Resistivity remains the same. When the thickness of the plate increases, area of cross section, which is perpendicular to the direction of current flow, the induced current flow is increasing. So resistance will decrease. So resistance decreases means the current flow will increase. When the current flow increases, the force F equal B I L. You know that's the force uh, induced current provides F equal B I L that will increase. The force increases means what will happen? The glider will experience more force means it will lose more kinetic energy. That's the answer you should give in this part. Okay, so I hope you understood uh, this discussion. Uh, link for the other Unit 4 paper discussions uh, is given on the description of this video. I, what I did uh, in Unit 4 discussions for other papers uh, is given in the, uh, at the, on the description of this video. Also, I'll discuss a uh, few more papers uh, very soon. Okay, bye.